I pretty much agree with the entire position you took. I just wanted to emphasize and ask one question. A couple of things that um, Derrida was remarked on um, creating new ethical spaces. In maybe the last mo three most important works that he has written, um, especially on politics of friendship, um, on the name, um, gift of death, especially on the name where he has an engagement with um, the concept of Cora, um, the attempt to somehow speak about the ethical relation outside of the confines of the Judeo-Christian ethic, as he does with his um, reflections on the work of Pachoka, um, and a variety of other places. He's made it abundantly clear that the <laughs> appellation uh, deconstruction was only ever to be considered one pole of a far more reconstructive um, enterprise. Um, I think that the ethics of tolerance, um, you call it modesty, um, that Derrida um, develops is a big step for clearing in the Heideggerian sense of opening a clearing for that space of reflection. Um, in my own work, I have tried to use that space as a space of experimentation and try to use some of the concepts from complexity science for starting that process of construction. And I just wondered if you thought that there is possibilities to make design interventions, especially into organizational structures, using the reconstructive elements of Derrida's um, philosophy. And to what extent we would need to formulate an ethical vocabulary that is outside of the confines of Judeo-Christianity. Yeah, so let's say Judeo-Christianity doesn't come into it at all. Uh, nor does middle class values. That is not what, what, I'm, what, I'm, what is meant with ethics. You know, ethics has to do with what we are. Uh, and if you say that, it becomes difficult to design a, pro come up with a sort of a program for ethics. Uh, because then you, then you will make the performative con contradiction, uh, at least within deconstruction. So uh, I, I don't think enough people are, know enough or is interested enough in, in, uh, in Derrida. So we can, some of this conversation we can have later. But to respond to your question, uh, th this kind of ethics is not necessarily a refutation of other ethical arguments. It is just a refutation of some form of well, ethical calculus as something that exists objectively outside that we have to find and then follow. So it, in, a, in a way, it says we, we should be doing what we, we should be doing our best with, the, with whatever methods we've been using as long as we recognize the limits of, of whatever model we have and assume the pro provisionality. So that does not make a, a big difference in what you, in sort of, in, 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 in how you go about planning your ethical programs or whatever. It does make a difference to how you see the status of those programs. So your five-year plan is not a five-year plan. It's a five-year plan that you've just drawn. But if you have to throw it out of the window tomorrow, you must have the courage to do it tomorrow, not after it's done five years' damage. So it's, it's that shift in attitude, I think, is the most important contribution of, of, uh, of, of this kind of position. It doesn't come up with, a, with another program or a new way of, of, of doing it. Not precisely. Um, but again, I want to emphasize the, the reconstructive elements of Derrida's thinking, especially with his conversations with Gilles Deleuze mm. and with uh, Felix Guattari. I mean, Felix Guattari's schizoanalytics is a platform. It's not a plan, but it's a platform for continuous modeling, for continuous experimentation, with always the caveat that one must be modest. You know, but it's, in, it's, getting, it's uh, getting organizations to embark upon that creative process. A uh, topic which will obviously be coming up again in our conference tomorrow, you know, is, is something that needs it needs a stimulus, and I think you are right that deconstruction does act as that stimulus. But I think it can do so not just personally, but also organisationally. That was the yeah. point I was trying yeah. to make. So, thank you.
I'd like to say first, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think this is probably the best exposition of scientific method I have ever seen. Um, it would be uh, wonderful if we can post this to um, the discussion list for the New England Complex Systems Institute because they have been going on for a couple of months um, stomping on each other's toes, uh, beating the wrong issues to death, not able to make these kind of fundamental clear distinctions. Uh, you would introduce a profound element of clarity into an almost untractable situation. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they've been talking about SoCal, and yeah, nobody has a good handle on this stuff. Um, what interests me in a bit more technical fashion, um, and I don't know, uh, you know, you and Keith obviously have a lot in common on the literature, which exceeds, yeah. um, you know, my knowledge of yeah. philosophical literature. So we, we can leave that aside. But, yeah, if we could leave it aside for a minute. Um, there is this very interesting phenomenon um, going back now almost 70 years, um, einstein rosen Podolsky paradox, which among other things, um, if you're familiar with it, I'm not entirely sure that it's a paradox so much as an attempt by two opposing groups. The um, relativity theorists on the one hand who will give up quantum mechanics in order to preserve uh, the Einsteinian notion of space-time uh, in its full mathematical exposition. And on the other hand, um, the quantum mechanics theorists who don't really care much um, about uh, macroscopic uh, events and, in fact, uh, rebut, and I would go back to Bell's theorem, and more importantly than the theorem, not just ivory tower, Gedanken experiment stuff, but the fact that in the lab, you know, people have been doing this experiment now since 72, and they can demonstrate true simultaneity over 11 kilometers. Uh, you do it over 11 kilometers, you can do it over 11 light years. Um, they also demonstrate a number of ways in which you can violate uh, uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, I, I'd like to ask a general and a specific question. Uh, my general question would be sort of how you view the tribal warfare between physicists. And then my specific question, uh, and this goes back to quantum gravity and something I find troubling in Lee Smolin's work um, when he makes such a definitive statement that everything that exists is in the universe. We can't talk about anything that exists outside the universe, which sounds very sensible, but then I would pose the counter question, is then the universe its own basis? basin of attraction. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I, I do not know enough about physics, quantum mechanics to, to enter all those debates. Uh, so, general answers. I'm in favor, in favor of disputes. Um, uh, we must just find a good way of, 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 of handling ourselves in disputes. We are, not, we are still quite bad at that because yes. we, we tend to take it personally when we, have, when we have disagreements. We have to find better ways of disagreeing because disagreeing breaks up differences and the more differences you have, the more meaning you have. So uh, I am in, in, in favor of confrontation. Yes. <laughs> you, you agree. <laughs> <laughs> wholeheartedly <laughs> to the first point. And um, the methodology of disagreement is as important as the substantive uh, pieces of your paper that I'd like you to get across to the New yeah. England group. Uh, and and part, of, part, of, of, part of, uh, of confrontation is also not to take yourself too seriously. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wasn't nodding necessarily agreement to your answer to the second question, because I think it's, it's one that may not have an answer. Okay. But I was nodding my satisfaction that you had a position on it. Thank you. Julian. Oh, I'd just like to thank you for a fantastic uh, paper. I, was, I don't really know what to say. There's so many questions. Um, just one thing that occurred to me, that what you're talking about, the performative contradictions and in this um, battle in academia. Well, my experience working in organizations, exactly the same things happen in organizations. Um, there's, uh, there's a definite uh, vocabulary of rationality 
and certainty, which actually closes down a lot of change and creativity. Mm. Um, so I think there's a lot of there's a need for this in organisations. And, and a, a quote from Maturana sprang to mind: um, "The claim to knowledge is a demand for obedience," <laughs> which I think is exactly yeah, think. you know what you're talking about. And um, uh, yeah, just, just thought it very very good. Um, oh. Very good. I'd like to talk to you later. Okay, we'll talk. <laughs> we'll talk. And that's Julian Betton, by the way, our, our artist. Okay, it's Roland then Roland. Yeah, just, just, just yeah. point, one is to try and clarify some of the performative contradictions I hear in my work. Because a lot is spoken, but very little is meant. Yeah. So performative contradictions or a performative tension is in a way inevitable. We, we try, we, we fake Anyway, we fake being clear and rational about the world. Absolutely. And we have to. It's not that we, we, there's no reason to be vague or unclear, but you should, you should know that but as soon I'm as in trouble. Exactly. That's, <laughs> that's the one sentence summary of the whole paper. Yeah? I'm in trouble. But as soon as this certainty is ever challenged, that there's a, it brings up so much fear and anxiety. That there's, there's much more there, much more certainty in the rational response to any challenge, yeah. which I find all the time. It's very difficult. Yes. He, Basically, what I got uh, was that you were relating modest positions to what perhaps Habermas would call redeeming the claims that you, you make, so that you are always prepared to redeem whatever you assert or you propose. Mm -hmm. Now, you made at the beginning a couple of assertions. One was that uh, you couldn't actually, in complexity, uh, do calculus, that that was almost uh, contradictory with the notion of ethics there. Complete. Yeah. Calculus in the you were yeah. basically somehow uh, discouraging us to get into tools, techniques, all kinds of things that. No, I, I, well, I'm, I'm glad you read it that way because then, <laughs> then, it, then it's something that's itching there. I've, I've got no arguments against models. I'm only talking about the limits of models. Yes. So as soon as you s interpret my argument against the limits of models as an argument against models, you're probably using models in an overly strong no, no, way. No, no, it's interesting that you already took, I, I have not mentioned uh, the idea of against. I'm saying that what you were suggesting at the beginning, and I took the note, is complexity is not about tools and techniques. I that's, that's, I, I, well, I, I may have taken you, it wrongly, yeah, yeah. but that's uh, before you started reading. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the point I'm trying to get at is that I think uh, complexity could also help us to design a better society. Could help us to, for instance, in ethical terms, I would say a calculus that would allow us to, 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 to establish the consequences of our actions as a ripple effect into many other levels of society so that we are able to move from the, the actions that we take in our own position to the consequences that these actions may have several layers uh, apart from us. Now, if we could have a, a calculus to help us to, uh, to work out uh, these, these consequences, perhaps we would have a, a, the chance to operate in a much more ethical sense in, in, as an individual and also as companies and all the rest. Okay. So, uh, I, I would be careful to, to, to say you have to redeem your claim, or at least I would say it, it is, uh, I'm, I was wondering whether your, 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 the limitations you were setting to calculus was a, a modest uh, statement, or perhaps it was an arrogant <laughs> thing. Mm. Yeah, well, if you're too modest, of course, you're, you, you flip around, it becomes very easy. I was that you were David Copperfield, was it Uriah Heep, that character? I'm no, no master Copperfield, I'm much too humble for that. Uh, so that, I mean, that, there is a trap here somewhere as well. Uh, but uh, um, this issue of modeling, uh, is, 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 I did not really speak about that much, but it is a, a, a very tricky issue because uh, I, I do not deny that we may perhaps have the tools, the technology to replicate complexity in a certain way. I mean, our computers are comp complex enough. Uh, my, 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 I'm concerned about, about knowledge in the way I understand it, not in the way that it's used sort of loosely in terms of knowledge management or something. What is understanding? How do we understand the system? And I really think we do understand the system. I don't think we, the, the fake understanding. But that understanding has to do with limits. If we have a complex model, 
then the model has emergent properties of its own. Um, and it is very difficult to, to, to compare and regulate what is emergence in the model, what is emergence in the real world. If it is a very complex model, how do we keep it entrained with reality all the time? You have to have exactly the same inputs going into the model as it was going into the real world. And what is going into the real world? Well, life, the universe, and everything. So in that sense, complex models can be very, very dangerous things. I'm not saying we should not make them. I'm not trying, you know, I'm not... But you yeah. see, what I hear you is you are basically in a representationist type of uh, uh, view of modeling. So you are basically thinking about models as representations. I'm criticizing, I'm models criticizing of, a representation. As, as representations of, yeah. And the way I, I, I personally understand the model is not as a representation. I think we construct models as we interact among ourselves. You know? yeah. And it's in that process that emergence happens. You yeah. know? I but agree but with that. I think, in a way, if you and I share a particular construct, it may well be that we coordinate our actions in such a way that something very interesting happens. Now, that is the way in which I would use a model, not in the sense of being representation of reality. So th that's where, again, I think it would be interesting to have a caveat about what we, talk, we, we mean by modeling. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that's something we need to take up at our plenary session later on. Now, do, is it really just one sentence? Yeah, just okay, one. quick. <laughs> and then Roland. I just wanted to comment. Um, Basically, uh, the uh, point, uh, the whole point here is a, uh, a conceptual overview of what does it mean to build a model. Uh, Gödel, but David Hilbert, in the early part of the 20th century, laid out a formulation of things that would need to be proved in order to have complete mathematics. And Gödel very clearly and conclusively rebutted this around 1930 with his incompleteness theorems. And this is something that a lot of people have difficulty grasping. And you know, a major part of this exposition was explaining how this plays conceptually. Uh, and what it, you know, completeness and decidability are not actually possible. It's been well established for some 70 years. It's very difficult for human beings to get that. Yeah. Physicists especially, and, and the one sentence comment I wanted to make, which has to do with <laughs> frames, is, I was speaking about Bell's theorem and true simultaneity to a, a very old Nobel laureate who had been a colleague of Einstein. And as I proceeded to uh, explain this to him, he started screaming at the top of his lungs, the data must be wrong. It's not possible. So we get very attached emotionally to our both to our cognitive models. and motivated biases. Thank you. Roland and then, and, and then Herod. Maybe you can help me um, uh, by, by, the, by the, the linkage. I, I'm all for modesty. I mean, let me, let, let me not refute the conclusion, but not necessarily for these reasons. Um, you know, not being a philosopher, let me start from, from simple experience. Um, in my experience in slugging through a quantum mechanics course at university, um, and years later through Gödel's, Gödel's theorem and, and, and more recently through complexity theory, um, the, the experience is that it leads to a deeper insight and more knowledge about how reality works. And, and you know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the intuitive, that's the, that's the experience, that's the feeling you, I have when I, when I delve into those things. And therefore, you know, my first reaction is that, is that you say, well, actually, there's less knowledge in that. I, I, I find deeply troubling. Um, and I wonder whether it, it is about a, a definition of knowledge that, in a sense, is trivial. Uh, and, and therefore, the argument that you need to be modest about that trivial knowledge in itself would be trivial. Um, and so, what, what this, and, and so I'm wondering what, what path have I chosen? And, and it is to, you know, from from the from the experience of being excited about the knowledge that lies in, you know, if we take quantum mechanics, Gödel, and, and complexity for simplicity's sake, um, is to try to find. You know who is who has written about um, about different ways of acquiring knowledge within those frameworks, yeah. and you know, for example, Bortoft. I don't know if you know the writing about Goethean uh, phenomeno phenomenology. <laughs> um, it is is one avenue of of of, of trying to es to establish sense within those kinds of paradigms. But so, so the, the source I, of my confusion I, I, is this, I can you know, see, this I can knowledge see. is, you know, who cares? We're beyond that knowledge. I don't know. 
Uh, but the, the, you, I think you, you misunderstood the point. I'm not, uh, I, I'm ex I argued ag exactly against relativity. So th there, there, there is no argument that that, that is useful, that, that knowledge, that the knowledge the physicist has is somehow uh, unimportant. Or, uh, actually, actually, we should have a whole discussion on what knowledge is. I, mean, yes. th that's, I just uh, made a note of that. Um, <laughs> And, it's, and it is tricky. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't have a sort of a nice little packaged answer for you. Uh, in the first place, there is usually a difference, a, a difference of opinion when we talk, about, when, when there's talk about knowledge between social scientists and natural scientists. Uh, uh, and what I, and I th I th we should maintain that difference a little bit, but I think there are differences of degree. Um, so uh, there is a much larger stability in scientific knowledge than in, in the knowledge we have of social, social, social sciences, although, although I don't think it's a different kind of knowledge, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand knowledge as a relational thing, as, as linking a lot of things together. And what we have in, in, in science is a very fairly stable pattern of relationships. A lot of people agree on what is, what is knowledge uh, and what counts as, as knowledge. Uh, the, the, pr the problem I'm con concerned is, is perhaps on a s slightly higher level, and that is the meaning or the use of, of that knowledge. So as soon as you start using your, your, your claim that I'm a, not personally made it all, that I'm a, f I, uh, I'm a physicist, I understand how the world works, and therefore I can also make claims about other things. That, it, that jump, that is the, that is the main criticism uh, uh, in my argument. It's not an attack on the status of your knowledge. At the same time, I'm also saying that, uh, that I, don't, I, don't, uh, I, mean, I, I don't think it's a claim you would make, but that the knowledge we have of physics at the moment is absolutely true. It is the way the universe really is. I mean, if you think of, of, of string theory, I mean, it's about as abstract philosophical as you can get. With string theorists, they don't even worry whether strings actually exist or not. It's just a matter of the mathematics works. So uh, I'm interested in this, in this sort of the politics of knowledge in a way, which is not separated from knowledge itself. Thank Don't you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for your contribution because it raises a number of questions, but mine are a bit different. One of the things that I have difficulty with is that it's so obvious that our understanding of the world is limited. I mean, there are lots of things that we don't know anything about, like opinions, values, yeah. etc. Nowhere in the literature can you find actually an understanding of opinions. Just to give an example of another part where I have real difficulties, you say um, complex systems can be understood in terms of allowed the number of components which interact in a nonlinear way, and eventually you say uh, no way in which you can reduce the amount of interactions. Now, think about a set of humans, a group of humans who interact. Now, if we are talking about the interactions, then obviously we are not talking about the humans. So we identify a certain area that we are interested in, which is the interactions. So actually, talking about complexity is in itself a reduction. Now, the question is, is it a sufficient reduction? Then, curiously, you say that even this reduction can be further reduced. Namely, um, we can make a model of that. We have to reduce the complexity of the system. Well, that's precisely what people, of course, do not do. Once you have identified that something is interacting and that the interaction is precisely the incompressible part that you are interested in, then you are going to study that particular part. This is what, for example, Newton has been doing when he was talking about his pendulum system, about his planets. And as you know, the whole notion of chaos was actually developed by Quincare when he was studying precisely the fact that planets or bodies are interacting in an irreducible way. 
So yeah. he didn't make models that were actually reducing the complexity. His models were precisely fitting the complexity. It was only the solution of the differential equations that Newton simplified because he didn't have computers. But Poincaré actually computed the solutions to some extent. So you cannot say that we cannot reduce complexity it is actually the precisely the point where we start to be interested in it. Because yeah. any complexity is already a reduction of the whole system that you are studying. So I'm not quite sure why you are so insistent on saying that complexity is incompressible. Newton knew that already. Well, either we misunderstand each other or I do disagree with you profoundly. <laughs> <laughs> what, so when I say uh, we have to reduce complexity. I say we have, to, we, we, we have to reduce complexity, but we introduce error when we do it. Okay, so just to make that point, so our reductions are useful things. We cannot but reduce complexity in order to try and understand it, but it introduces an error. If you start looking at things that can be reduced to simple equations, I would argue that you're not dealing with complexity. You're dealing with complicatedness at the most. So the Mandelbrot set for me is not a complex object, it's a complicated object, but it can be reduced to a single recursive equation. And that is the problem with a lot of arguments from chaos theory. There's a logical inversion takes place. Because you have a simple equation or set of equations that can show apparent complex behavior, you reverse the argument and think, if I have complex behavior, maybe there is a simple equation that, uh, that's, a, that just, that's just a logical uh, uh, error. So uh, the fractal mathematics, which uh, uh, straightforward, nonlinear mathematics, is fascinating and it's very useful and so, but I don't think it says that much about complexity. When we talk about complex, social complex systems, and that is, I think, where, where the discussion in the complexity society should progress a little bit beyond this dichotomy between say, Santa Fe and those using yes. complexity as a metaphor, we should realize that there are serious differences between uh, 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 modeling a, a Brownian motion and, uh, and modeling a, a democratic process. Yes. There, are, there are really serious differences. And, uh, 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 this use of scientific metaphors and to transform them into other domains are very, very uh, risky. I don't say we shouldn't do it, but, but, it's, but it's very risky. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe the major problem then is that we misunderstand each other because we are so different. Because what I think is that what you're talking about is an opinion about phenomena. Whereas what we actually are interested oh, in, of so course, I have, I have is opinions and, and scientists have facts. Is that, no, is that, no. is that the distinction? No, no. <laughs> well, let me put it differently because it's not enough to, to make a joke to get out of it. The fact, the fact that we have opinions which we do not understand at all doesn't mean that sometimes we do not make observations. Now, observations do not have to be about something. Very often, they are only the things we report. My point when I was discussing it is that whatever you do when you're talking about something that is incompressible, you have already reduced it. If you're yes. talking about a group of people who are interacting, you don't talk about the fact that some people are bold, that some people have red hair, some people are wearing glasses, yeah. and so on and yeah, so on. Yeah, yeah. So you're studying precisely that because it's incompre uh, incompressible and not because you have made the reduction. Thank you very much. Did you want to say? <laughs> I, I feel I have to, but... <laughs> I want you to keep that for the, for the discussion later on. Because if we lose all the, <laughs> the passion now, um, it, it, we need to continue it. So um, thank you, Paul, again very much indeed. And thank you, everyone, as well.